Hi, I'm Patricia Grabarek. And I'm Katina Sawyer, and welcome to the Worker Being Podcast. Today, Patricia has an article for us. So before we get into kind of catching up and seeing how things are going, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what we're going to hear about today? Yeah, so we're going to talk about COVID-19, which is obviously on everybody's minds, um, and health anxiety. So people that are anxious about getting COVID-19 and how that impacts their wellness and productivity at work. That's super interesting, actually. I was just thinking about that the other day of like how, and I was just talking to some people about it too, about how just like being in the constant state of worry about just like going outside has to have some impact on people's wellness. It's not just about like protecting yourself and like your actual physical health, but the worry about what might happen to your health. So that's super interesting. Yeah, I think it's a really great article. So I'm very excited to dive into it. But before we get started... Uh, this podcast is airing on Thanksgiving in the U.S. So happy Thanksgiving, everybody. The happy Thanksgiving, Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, very exciting. Uh, very, very pumped that uh, we are here with you for another Thanksgiving to talk about all the things we are grateful for this year. And um, even though it's Thanksgiving for the listeners, for us, the election just happened. And I will say that I am grateful that we have the first female vice president ever. Very yes. exciting. That is a good, good one to be grateful for. I was going to say, this is probably the most important year for us to <laughs> sit down and actually think about what we're grateful for. Since yeah. This year has been really rough for a lot of us. A um, lot of loss in terms of family members, jobs, social time I mean our just our lives we've lost a lot this year so yeah I think taking that time to think about what you're grateful for is really important so I think that's a good one to start us off great yeah for first female vice president I like that yeah I feel like you know it's just been such a whirlwind of a year like you were saying it's so difficult sometimes when all of these things are around you to you know, and just happening in people's lives. Like you said, people have, you know, lost loved ones, people have been sick or, you know, there's just been so much, um, you know, unrest and terrible, like murders going on. I mean, there's just like so many things, right. That have been happening all year long and that have been happening for a long time. And like a thread of things that just seems like sometimes you're like, wow, like, can we, can we start to turn, turn the wheels around here? And I think that, you know, just the idea for, for me. And I think for a lot of people out there that really didn't hit me until I was watching the, um, speeches the other night, uh, and watching Kamala Harris's speech and thinking, you know, it's so weird to think that our whole lives, we've never seen a woman in that office or higher in our country like it's so strange and I was saying that to Brendan when we were watching the speeches you know like this is such a crazy moment because our whole lives we've been told that we can do anything we want but we've never seen anyone do that (laughs) you know um and so I I feel I feel really I felt really hopeful and grateful um you know thinking about all of the little girls watching And that that won't be true for their experience. So even though this has been a super rough year and there's a lot of bleakness, I think, that happened over the course of the year and just really things feeling really topsy turvy, like that moment of seeing all those little girls faces in the audience, too. It's like, wow, like a generation of girls will not be able to say that anymore. That's like really cool to me. So I'm super grateful for that. Oh, I love it. I think you worded that perfectly that is so great it's so oh, it's just nice it is nice to see some of that I think it's even though like you said we've been told that we can do whatever we want I feel like never seeing it does ha- take a toll and does make an impact and and I think the older I got I was like well can we really though like or are yeah. people gonna stop us and yeah and I still think some of that does happen, but obviously this is a good first step um, yeah. to see people at that top, 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 top leadership. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that we have, we have that to be grateful for. We also have to be grateful for this year that our business has really grown a lot and um, we've been doing so much more 
client work this year and uh you know you just did our first speaking gig <laughs> it's like exciting there's a lot going on I think for us as a business um and a lot more to come for us that I think you know when we look back on what we've done this year was a big milestone for us and sort of breaking into a new space in a big way so I am also really grateful for that yeah we I mean our business has taken off in such a way that we just did not anticipate we definitely thought I know we've talked about this on the podcast before but we definitely thought that COVID was going to slow our growth instead of help kind of push us in the right direction so yeah that's been a nice surprise. Um, I'm grateful for all the people that we've worked with, all the people that have helped us along the way too, like um, the group that we worked with for our website, updating that, our yeah. ad, our Good ad call. person. I think we have a lot of like, a lot of really great help too around us. Obviously, we're always very grateful for Allie, our podcast producer, and all the amazing work she's done. Even though she had a baby this year, she worked with us to get all the episodes done before she went on leave. So yeah. I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'm grateful for Danny's help with all of our graphics and things that he's always working on for free. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Um, it's nice to have a husband that can do something useful for our business. A hundred percent. Gosh, like that. I mean, there's so much to be grateful for in terms of worker being yeah. And, then, and all of uh, all the people listening, like our following has grown um, this year. We have got to meet and talk to so many more of you and so many more people have been sending us emails and connecting and we've made so many um, cool connections with people who run businesses that are in a similar space. Um, and so I think, you know, we're just starting to I think a cool thing in an entrepreneurial journey that we're learning is that sometimes other people can point you in a direction of where your business should go sometimes better than you can in terms of like following what people are interested in and oh what do people what are what are people wanting to hire us for and what's the feedback we're getting external perspective from other people on what we should be doing and um how we should be positioning ourselves. So like all of that feedback and all those interactions that we've had with all of you and similarly minded folks in the community have led us to this really great spot where I feel like we're entering 2021 with really interesting and exciting potential for new, even more new stuff to happen. So that's been awesome. Yes. Agreed. Uh, definitely grateful for everybody that follows along, listens to our podcast, um, follows our social and reads our articles uh, I do love like continue you mentioned like that first kind of speaking thing that I did this week well, last week and that was really fun because I mean we've done a lot of conference speaking we've done a lot of speaking in in other venues but having a an engagement come our way because of worker being was cool and it was also fun because the person who organized it listens to the show so Hi. Yeah. I'm listening now. And so she gave a really great little shout out to the show and the podcast. And afterwards, I got a lot of pings from people that are starting to listen in too. So welcome, welcome. Um, so it's just really fun to see, you know, the impact and people getting excited about the content. Because for us, what matters is people taking this information and making a difference in their lives to be healthier and to thrive in their workplace. So Hopefully it'll continue and we can continue to grow and build. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, something really cool is that we have, even so far this year, we have, compared to the full year last year, we have increased the number of people that have come to the site by like seven like by like 30 percent or something like that we've got 30 more vi percent more visitors so far this year now to date than we had last year the whole year so we're getting a lot more like engagement um on people reading the blog podcast stats are really hard to track but we know that uh we were seeing a lot more movement there as well um and there's just like a lot of cool 
stuff going on in terms of, you know, where our listeners are coming from. So the majority are from the United States, the people that interact with our content. But we also have people listening uh, from India, from the Netherlands, from Canada, from the UK, from Australia, from the Philippines, Germany, South Africa, Pakistan. Like there's all these different places that people are listening to, um, you know, what we what we're putting out there. And, you know, we obviously couldn't keep putting it out there if it wasn't for all of you all over the world. So if you're listening and you're someplace other than the United States, that's also really cool to us and we're excited to be able to have that reach so grateful for everyone all over the globe that are united I like to think of all our like little like our hive members as like little dots all over the globe and we're all like connected by health and wellness in the workplace which is fun to me and exciting so I'm grateful for that little map if we could like light it up like little lights all over the globe and see who's listening that would be so fun (laughs) oh my gosh that would be so fun (laughs) (laughs) Not to be Any. creepy. We don't need like little points for every person exactly no. where you are. But no, no, we don't need personal information. This is not that kind of thing. But I, but I do think it would be cool just to like see like a little map of where people are showing up. And when we look at you know just the countries people are coming from, it's really cool to see the spread um, and how many people are engaging with our content all over the world. So this has been a year of uh, I think breaking through. Uh, barriers both societally we've seen people overcome a lot of hardships and challenges we've all been so resilient through all of the things that have you know tried to throw us for a loop this year if you're here um, and you know you've made it through the year like that's an accomplishment and then we're also seeing women break through barriers and uh, you know politics and government and then we've broken through some barriers in our own business so I think 2020 I've been grateful for as a year of like it's been a rough year but it's also been a year that kind of has showed us what we can do um, even under pressure in a tough time and I think that's a really good lesson to bring forward into next year yes I agree so let's all carry through take everything that we're grateful for this year Uh, I'm sure we'll have another wrap up when we get closer to the new year um, as well. I'm sure we'll have similar sentiments as we're moving forward. And then once we get into 2021, hopefully we can take everything that we've learned in this tough year and make next year better because COVID's probably not going anywhere for a little while. Yeah. Unfortunately. It'll still be, yeah. It'll still be a weird time, but now that we've, you know, we're getting to the end of 2020, hopefully we can take what we've learned in 2020 to make 2021 better, even if we're not able to, you know, resume what we would consider normal life. Yep. Totally agree. And on that note, this kind of lends us nicely into the topic of the article. Yes. Um, So the article is called Working in a Pandemic, Exploring the Impact of COVID-19 Health Anxiety on Work, Family, and Health Outcomes. And it was just published November of 2020 in the Journal of Applied Psychology by... Trugas, Chawla, and McCarthy. Cool. So, yeah, it's brand new. And one of these awesome. COVID articles we talked about. Yeah, it's awesome. It's very exciting. Cutting edge stuff. Brand new. Yes, brand new. Um, so, okay, let me give you a rundown of what they looked at here. So this article is really interesting because the sample they used was a Canadian sample right when they shut down. Mm. So, basically, Canada shut down. And they start, people started getting surveys um, to talk about this. So it was right at that transition point um, when they started collecting data, which I think is really interesting. So it's kind of at the probably the height of our anxiety around this in a lot yeah. of ways because now suddenly we're shut down. There's all sorts of things changing. So it's like a very interesting snapshot of time as to what was going on with folks during that period yeah, of time. Yeah, totally. Um, so I mentioned COVID-19 health anxiety. That is a concept they've obviously just created, Mm -hmm. um, which is related to the term health anxiety, uh, basically similar concept where you have some sort of fear apprehension about your health. And in this case, it's a fear and apprehension about contracting Mm COVID-19. Yeah. So, So basically this study looks at if I have this anxiety, what does that lead to? What kind of impact does that have? So they looked at a couple of things. They created this like whole framework um, where you're looking at health anxiety. And then what does that trigger? So they looked at, um, there's, there's theories around how you handle anxiety. And that anxiety is going to trigger 
defense mechanisms. I'm sure everybody's heard of fight or flight as a response mm-hmm. to a threat. So you can fight and do something about it. Or this flight piece is more passive, like trying to avoid it. So one way that people avoid stressors that cause anxiety, they one thing that they'll do is they'll suppress their emotions. So it's basically a response where you're trying to cope with a situation where you're basically just trying to hide how you're feeling. You're just don't want to think about feeling anxious. You just deny, deny, deny those Hmm. emotions for yourself. Okay. So they talk about the fight or flight and then they kind of focus in on the flight part in terms of I'll just keep my emotions to myself. I'll just try to squash them um, Mm -hmm. and make them sort of non-existent. Did they focus at all on the fight part or no? So they did, and that will be a piece that I'll talk about in a minute. But basically, the fight part, they talked about problem-focused coping strategies. Mm, okay. um, and in this study, they specifically asked about hand-washing. So okay. um, how much you ha- you wash your hands, you're doing something active, if you will, to fight mm. your anxiety um, versus trying to suppress how you're feeling. Gotcha. Okay, so there's sort of like a... I can solve this problem by taking action to make myself as cleanly as possible, as opposed to I'm just going to sort of pretend like this isn't happening. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so you can imagine the people that are doing this emotion suppressing. They're the people that the beginning of COVID, when you ask them how they were doing, they're like, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm okay. You know, just not really engaging with those emotions in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of us probably did some of this um, just trying to ignore all the stress and anxiety that we're feeling yeah um, just suppressing all of that versus managing it yeah that makes perfect sense okay so those are sort of the two reactions that they looked at did they look at any other reactions or just those two well then they looked at so the main model if you will what they wanted to look at was how does health anxiety impact emotion suppression okay and they said well emotion suppression when people do that they are less likely to get their psychological needs met. Hmm. Um, So there's, we talked about, I believe we've talked about self-determination theory before on the podcast, but basically what it is, is people have these needs um, for competence. So you need to feel like you're good at things. They have a need for relatedness. So feel like you're good at, uh, like you have good relationships. You um, are able to interact with people and have those positive interactions from a social perspective. Mm -hmm. And then people also need to feel autonomous so they have some control. So you can imagine that with COVID, there's a lot of those things are questioned, right? Yeah. We're getting social, um, our social lives have changed a lot. Um, in terms of our sense of control and autonomy, I mean, we don't have a lot of control over the situation and they argued that if you're suppressing your emotions, And this has been found with lots of other studies outside of COVID um, research. But if you're suppressing your emotions, you're actually really likely to impact all of those things. The competence, relatedness, Mm. and autonomy. Because when you're suppressing your emotions, you're taking it. It's it's an active mental task to make yourself not feel that emotion. Right? Yeah. To try to push it down, push it down. So that's going to impact your cognitive functioning. So it's going to impact like... How well, you know, thinking through things, you know, just Mm -hmm. how you're functioning from a mental perspective. Um, So that would impact your competence. Um, If you're suppressing your emotions, that means you're not sharing your emotions with people. You're not going to feel as connected to people. So that will impact your relatedness. Yeah. Um, And then the piece of around autonomy, they talked about, you know, again, you're suppressing your emotions. So you're not really having control of the emotions. You're trying to get control, but you're like kind of doing this fight with yourself. But, you know, in, in terms of autonomy. So. It's very, it sounds like, I feel like I made that way more complicated than it needed to be. No, no. No, you think it's so clear? No, I think I'm get. I'm staying with you. So it takes mental energy for me to not feel something. So I think we can all agree with that. Like if you're in a situation where, you know, you're, let's say like, super excited but everyone around you is super bummed like that would take some mental energy to try to like match the room right because you have to like tamp down how you're feeling or if you're super sad and everyone around you or you're in a professional setting or whatever the case may be think about like if you feel like you want to cry at work 
you really can't stop thinking about anything other than trying not to cry <laughs> during that period of time. Or if you're really mad about something and you're trying not to show that you're mad. So thinking about like, let's say you're in a customer service interaction, a customer's being really rude to you. It takes a lot of restraint. And I think the word restraint um, fits nicely here because it's like an active word, right? It takes a lot of restraint to get yourself to like mentally back down from feeling all of those feelings of anger and anxiety that crop up when you're in a conflict with somebody um, and to respond more positively. So that makes a lot of sense that that would take a lot of mental energy. And then of course, like your mental energy is not unlimited. So you only have Mm -hmm. so many resources to put towards your work. And so it sounds like what they're basically saying is when you're deploying a lot of resources to manage your emotions, you have fewer resources to put towards what you need to be doing, which then decreases your ability to, you know, feel these main motivators towards your work. Yeah, exactly. So that's psychological need fulfillment. So it's basically I'm anxious about COVID. I am suppressing my emotions and therefore my psychological needs are not met. And so then what does that lead to? That leads to me not meeting my goals at work. Um, It leads to me not focusing as much on my family and friends. So not putting enough attention into my family. Mm -hmm. And then it leads to like physical complaints. Like I have headaches or I feel tired or I feel Mm -hmm. weak or achy or whatever. Gotcha. So that's the theory and spoiler, that's what worked. (laughs) Yeah, cool. Okay, that's good. (laughs) So basically, um, just to kind of restate it. So people that have more COVID anxiety, they're less likely to be effective at work, less likely to be engaged with their family. They tend to have more physical complaints. And that's because they're not fulfilling their psychological needs as a result of suppressing their emotions. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really interesting. And and who did they get this data from? And did they gather it like over time? Or mm-hmm. um, I'm just curious, like how they came to that conclusion. Yeah. So they had 503 participants in their final sample. Um, they had to work at least 20 hours a week. Um, again, Canadian, as I mentioned earlier, and there were four different surveys each a week apart. So the first week when the shutdowns happened, they sent out a survey and people were asked questions about their anxiety. So am I worried about catching COVID, et cetera? The second time period, a week later, they're asked about whether or not they're suppressing their emotions. And they're also Mm -hmm. asked about the hand washing, which I'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. Then in time three, so two weeks after the first one, um, they are asked about their psychological need fulfillment. So are they feeling competent? Are they feeling autonomous, et cetera? And then finally, basically at the end of the month, they've been doing this for a month now, time four, they are asked about goal progress. Um, So like things like I have made good progress on my job-related goals, Mm -hmm. family engagement, which is I focus my attention on family and our friends, and those physical complaints like headaches, you know, I've had headaches, et cetera. Gotcha. Okay, awesome. So they were sort of staggering it out to try to, as much as they could, see if these things are actually like leading to each other. Um, And they had a pretty sizable sample. So that's good. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a very impressive study for, I mean, how quickly they must have started it because of the time period. So I was very impressed by that. Um, so then I just want to touch on the hand washing piece. So kind of like the second thing they did is they wanted to look and see, all right, so now we understand this whole relationship. We understand that having anxiety leads to all these things where you're not meeting your goals as quickly. You're not making progress towards them. Mm -hmm. You're not engaging with your family. You've got some physical complaints, but what happens if you are doing something active? to cope with the situation. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where the hand washing came in. So if you are a hand washer, if you frequently wash your hands, it actually had this interesting effect where if I wash my hands all the time, I was less likely to suppress my emotions. Hmm. So it's almost like I'm buffering that. Like I'm, I'm feeling anxious, but I'm doing something. So maybe my emotions aren't as negative or maybe, for whatever reason, I'm not suppressing my emotions as much if I'm doing something active. So it's almost like, it almost seems like it is truly is this fight or flight, right? I'm fighting by washing my hands instead of flighting, flighting, <laughs> fleeing, <laughs> flighting, <laughs> instead of fleeing my emotions. So hmm. it does seem like people, you know, if you pick one, you're more likely to stick with that one than the other. 
Okay, so it helps me if I can find a way to actively cope with the problem, then I'm sort of giving myself a way of like releasing that tension. I'm coping with it. So now I don't need to suppress my emotions because I kind of already coped with it in a more effective way. Exactly. You got it. Did the hand washing lead through to the rest of the models? Like if I wash my hands, did my um, like psychological um, needs go up and my or my psychological like need fulfillment go up and the outcomes go up too? Or did it just sort of have a, a direct effect on the suppression of emotions? Yeah, it was more of like a I would say like a faucet. Like you turn on the hand washing and the rest of the relationships just a Kind of okay, gotcha. It's just like you don't just you don't suppress emotions. It doesn't necessarily lead to anything else. And then if you turn off the hand washing, suddenly you're suppressing your emotions, and it leads to these hmm. other things. So, I guess one takeaway here would be you know to wash your hands. But also, as things <laughs> have evolved, and as you mentioned, they did uh, this study. Um, you know during sort of peak COVID at the time when hand washing was really like the number one thing, but maybe we could think about this in terms of like wearing masks or, you know, being really compliant with mask wearing, um, thinking about other ways that you might make yourself feel, um, like you're actively coping with the issue. And, you know, if there are other directives that come to light, um, that following those directives and being really compliant with those directives can actually help you to feel like and to actually cope with the problem head on so don't try so I guess the take-home message is that if you try to you know distract yourself from doing the things that you should be doing to cope with um, things head on you're it's gonna come out somehow you're experiencing some kind of anxiety about it even if you want to pretend like you're not and by not addressing or actively approaching how to solve the problem you're gonna end up causing yourself a host of problems Exactly. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. That's an interesting um, perspective on the directives, like thinking about what's being recommended and being proactive to help yourself avoid the thing you're anxious about, right? If you're anxious about getting COVID, try not to get COVID. By yeah. Doing the yeah. things you're supposed to do. And I think also for managers, too, um, you know, giving people or reminders um, or, you know, role modeling those types of behaviors so that people feel comfortable to do them. But also, you know, even if you're talking about it or letting people know like, oh, you know what makes me feel better is that I do this or it might be a little bit overboard, but here's what I do. You know, I don't think any I think they said now like nobody has to like clean their groceries or anything like that. But like, you know, um, just talking about what you're doing to actively cope and the safety precautions that you're taking and encouraging other people to take take safety precautions could have other implications than just physical health. It sounds like it can also help you to, um, you know, make people feel better at work while they're working, but then also have these positive impacts that affect people's uh, performance at work and at home. Um, so encouraging people to actively take steps to cope isn't just a good safety behavior. It sounds like it has these other positive implications as well. Yeah. Um, and that's actually one of the things they talked about. So I like that you talked about how a manager or a leader can do that. And the study actually called out like companies specifically doing that, like thinking about training that you can provide to help mitigate anxiety, to help people learn effective coping me mechanisms because suppressing your emotions is not an effective coping mechanism. So what other things can people do? So helping um, employees understand that by providing trainings and seminars or webinars or whatever it is um, on different topics that can help is really important. So they specifically called out topics like resilience, stress management, work-life balance, um, which I'm going to plug our courses right here because we actually have a stress management course and we have a course that talks about, um, psychological capital, which includes resilience and can actually help people make progress towards their goals in a very sustainable way. So I'm going to put a link to all that. And since this is the Thanksgiving episode, there will be a coupon code for Black Friday and Cyber Monday. So I'll also include that here. So if you are interested in ways to help yourself cope, um, we have some tools too if your company is not providing them. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's a really good call out that the more resources you can provide to remind people. I mean, I think that one of the other things that I'm thinking about in these results is that it's really easy not to be in tune with what might be helpful to you. So maybe your, uh, maybe your like go-to strategy is more of an avoidance strategy than an active strategy. But 
So you might like naturally default towards like, well, I'm just going to pretend like I'm not worried about this. But active reminders can help you to engage in behaviors that might be healthier for you in the long run. And so any way that a company can promote people actually engaging in those more active behaviors is really positive. So um, if you want to, you know, provide those resources for not just reminders for yourself, but also for your team um, and making sure that people are thinking about active ways to cope as opposed to either just leaving people to their own devices or, you know, worse, not talking about anything, making it seem like, you know, suppression is the best answer and not even bringing up what people are doing and acting like it's not happening might encourage more people to act like it's not happening too, which seems like it might promote more suppression. Yeah. And you don't want your team members to suppress because your goals will be slowed down, your team goals. And obviously, um, we care about people uh, holistically. So thinking about how that impacts their physical complaints, physical health, their family engagement, like all those things are really important to the person. And so making sure that not only are, is the individual or your employees able to effectively get through what they need to get through from a work perspective, but also still have a fulfilling family life and have their physical health um, to be able to, you know, to move past this awful COVID year and years maybe um and do and do better than they could have otherwise if they were continuing to suppress their emotions yeah um I think that's really really great directive so try to role model those behaviors don't avoid talking about a problem if there's a problem talking about it head-on and discussing what people can do about it is better than leaving people to their own devices and if you're listening to this and feeling like maybe you've been trying to avoid some of the anxiety that you've been feeling. Um, it's good to self-reflect and recognize that and go wash your hands, wear a mask, <laughs> <laughs> you know, do all the things that you uh, should already be doing to keep yourself healthy, but know that you're not just keeping yourself physically healthy, but you're also keeping yourself mentally healthy by doing that as well. Yeah. And I put, actually wrote the very last thing on my notes for this article is fight, not flight. So go yeah, fight. <laughs> go fight. Go actively don't, cope. <laughs> don't be flighting, as you said before. <laughs> <laughs> don't flight uh, away. <laughs> no fleeing. No fleeing. Go in yes. and try to cope with it in a more active way. Yes, totally. Totally agree. Well, thank you so much for bringing this article to us. I think it's super helpful, super relevant, and will continue to be relevant um, throughout the course of the year, um, at least. So this is really, really helpful. Um, And I hope that everyone uh, takes some time to think about, even though we're in a tough year, we've experienced a lot of anxiety, take some time to think about um, what you're grateful for and what lessons you bring forward into the next year. And maybe one of them is uh, to uh, face your problems head on and start to work through what you need to do to keep yourself healthy and well. Yes. And thanks everyone for listening. I would, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what you're thankful for this year. Maybe there's some other things that we should be grateful for too, that we haven't thought through. So we'd love to hear your thoughts there. And we'd love to also hear your struggles and challenges with COVID and anxiety. And if you've thought of some really cool ways to cope with the stress We'd love to hear that from you too. And as I mentioned, if you have any um, interest in taking some classes to help with your coping strategies, I'll have all the links in the show notes as we always do. Um, And you can always contact us, as I mentioned, contact us at email, contact at workerbeing.com. You can find us on our website, workerbeing.com. And you can also find us on social at workerbeing on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for listening. The Worker Being Podcast is hosted by us, Patricia Grabarek and Katina Sawyer, and produced by Allie Johnson. Mm-hmm.